So is it appropriate to select a script that drops the F-bomb in like the first three lines as the very first project of a whole new series devoted to deep dive screenwriting feedback? I don't know, but I'm never gonna censor any writer, so thought I should give you a little bit of a heads up. screenwriting friends and welcome to the very first ever inaugural debut episode of the feedback loop technically we did two sessions prior to this but i didn't record them properly so here we are what we're going to do in this series is each week we're going to look at the first three pages of a different writer's script we're going to do a deep dive into them we're going to look through those pages word by word, page by page, and I'm gonna show you what they look like from the producer's perspective. Over the past nearly 20 years, I've reviewed tens of thousands of project submissions, I've read thousands of screenplays, and I've worked with tens of thousands of writers, and I can tell you that the, the big problem that writers have is very often you'll see something in your own head, but when you put it on the page, you don't necessarily put it in a, on the page in a way that when the reader reads it, they're gonna see the same movie you see in your head. So there's a little bit of a disconnect and it's very hard for writers to fully see and grasp that disconnect. So that's kind of what this series is hopefully going to, to change. <laughs> My belief is that if you keep coming back week after week after week, and you look at the different projects that we explore and talk to the different writers that we're going to be discussing their projects with, you'll start to see the kinds of things that get in your way, the kinds of things that can help make your work land the way you want it to land, and just have a general sense of why the vast majority of screenwriters' work is not going to be able to be used and how to do something about that. So each week, we're going to have the writer on the session as well. I'm gonna read out the pages, I'll show you the pages, uh, and then we'll discuss those pages afterwards with the writer themselves. When we're finished with that, we're gonna look at the first three pages of a famous script or story or movie. I'm gonna show you, for example, today, we're gonna to look at the first three pages of the screenplay for Logan. This is a Wolverine story uh, starring Hugh Jackman, and it's an action film, and, and the, the script writing itself is very solid in those first three pages. So we'll be able to look, take away some insights and learn a few things from that as well. Now, today's script comes to us from a writer out of Scotland by the name of Eddie McFadden. Eddie has written a script he has called Clara, and it is an action thriller. Now, Eddie is on the line, so we can discuss his pages with him after I've given you my initial thoughts. But this is a deep dive, so we're gonna spend the next hour, hour and a half, going right down the rabbit hole. So grab yourself a snack or something to drink, uh, take some notes along the way if you'd like to, and um, enjoy this first episode of The Feedback Loop. Fade in, exterior construction site, night. A portable construction light flickers. Beth Alloway, 30s. Usually cool and calm under pressure, but right now is not that fucking time. Leans back against a thick timber post. Exhausted, covered in mud. Her trembling right hand holds a 22 caliber handgun. She places her left hand on top of the gun. Steady. Nearby footsteps scuttle over concrete. Beth flicks off her gun's safety catch. The footsteps get closer and closer, then stop. The light flickers more urgently. Beth steps out from behind the timber post. She raises her gun, takes aim, and the lights go out. Three weeks earlier, Isle of Clara, Outer Hebrides. Exterior cliffs, night. 
Hurricane weather, violent surf breaks against the rocks of the shoreline. A wind turbine is battered by the elements. Sparks flash against the turbine's whirring blades. Smoke swirls from its motor like a Catherine wheel. Interior, exterior, police car moving. Windscreen wipers fight against driving rain. Headlights illuminate a no trespassing sign, snared in the mauled wired mesh that was once a fence. A police car passes through the dilapidated iron gates. Exterior oil terminal, night. The plant is a metal shell of rust and nail. An oil tank's faded insignia reads, sure oil. The police car parks up. Sergeant Ruth Alloway, 40s, forever curious and capable, steps out of the car and looks around. Ruth's POV. A classic Ford Cortina MK2 sits in front of the main building, headlights on and motor running. Ruth marches over to the Cortina, peers inside, and checks the driver's door. It's locked. She hears a hissing sound coming from a storehouse at the side of the building. Thick smoke escapes from the storehouse. Its doors swing in the storm. Interior storehouse, night. At the back of the storehouse, a small generator burns. Ruth spots an ancient fire extinguisher. She twists on her gloves and pulls the extinguisher from the wall. Ruth shoots foam into the flames. The fire subsides. Exterior terminal yard night. She hears running footsteps. Ruth scans the yard. The Cortina's headlights dazzle in the rain. Its motor continues to tick over. She peeks around the side of the storehouse, sees no one. Her personal radio beeps. Ruth into the radio. Ray, do you read me? Ray. Ruth checks her taser gun, her baton, and her pepper spray. She edges toward the main building. Exterior main building night. A makeshift barrier of corrugated iron blocks the entrance. Ruth wrestles the iron sheet aside and enters. Lobby. Ruth waves her flashlight over the deserted lobby. She hears the sound of water dripping from the ceiling and falling rain against corrugated iron. She negotiates debris scattered across the lobby floor, the eerie sound of a door swinging on its hinges. Bang! Ruth spins, then freezes on the spot. A door slam? Footsteps again. This is the police. Identify yourself, says Ruth. She draws her taser gun. Ruth steps forward and is enveloped by darkness. The door continues to squeak and squeak. Suddenly a flash followed by the sound of rapid gunfire. Bang, bang, bang. Exterior terminal yard, night. Army boots stomp across the rain-soaked yard and stop next to the cortina. Black leather gloves at the driver's door. We don't see their face, but someone climbs into the cortina and closes the door. The car's tires pull away over the gravel. Its headlights sweep past Ruth's empty patrol car. Interior main building lobby, night. The flashlight shines across the desolate lobby. And somewhere in the dark, Ruth's radio continues to beep. Okay, so those are the pages that we're going to talk about today. So the first thing that I wanted to say about these pages today are we're obviously starting with a, a, an action sequence. So it's obviously an action uh, opener. It's a way to try to pull the reader into um, something exciting is happening. We don't know what. Uh, the, the problem that we have with these pages today is that we don't know what's going on and there's not really anything specific to pull us into this this uh, this, uh, this scene, right? So what's happening in this situation? One of the things we do see is we see that there's Beth Alloway in her 30s, and then a couple of, um, a couple of scenes later, we meet Ruth. Where is she? Oh, she's buried in the bottom of the text here. Sergeant Ruth Alloway, 40s. So presumably related, presumably maybe sisters, maybe cousins, don't know yet. Uh, but we also don't see... We, we also don't see a link between who they are, right? So the, cha the, the first challenge we have is, let's think about this first scene here. Uh, the, she's on the construction site. She, it's nighttime. The light's flickering. She's usually, I like this introduction, usually cool and calm under pressure, but right now is not that fucking time. Even though uh, that took me like two reads to go, wait, what is he saying here? I like the general idea of it. I think it needs to be smoothed out a little bit. So, but she's leaning against a, a post. She's exhausted, covered in mud. You have a lot of images that are unfolding one after the other, but it's not really, there's nothing for us to hang on to, right? There's nothing for us to, we don't really know what's happening. 
Okay, so the, the, think about the logistics of this scene. We meet her, we have sort of a detail, we have another stray detail. She's holding a gun, but is it her gun? Is it, uh, uh, it, it's not, it's not clear, which is okay if you want to pull us into the story in a way that's unclear, but at the same time, we also have to be clear on what's the drama that's unfolding. So all we're seeing really right now, overall, She's on a construction lo- on a construction site. She's hearing footsteps. She goes to <laughs> aim her gun, and the lights go out, which is fine. But it's not in, it's not as dramatic as the way that you're writing it. Does that make sense? So the way you're writing is you're pulling mm-hmm. us through this action scene, but what it, what is we're not really clear on what it is. Does that make sense? Yes, so far. It does. So, so far. the. The, the, the main challenge is this is your intro, right? So now you're going right. to say three weeks earlier. So we're doing this major sort of reverse time jump. But in order for this really to work, in order for us to go three weeks earlier, this needs to have something happen. Um, I don't know what the drama of the story is that's going to unfold, but let's imagine she... I don't know, finds a severed head or something. Yeah, like, you know what I mean? She like something major happen has to happen here that gives us a real pow moment. And then we take that breath and the three weeks later is going to pull us in or three weeks earlier is going to pull us in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so three weeks earlier, we go to, we go to, uh, we go to this island these cliffs and we're again into um, sort of this uh, slightly staccato description of imagery, right? So it's sort of like image, 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 which is cool, but they're not really adding up. So we're not really seeing how the images are coming together to form a clear picture of what the, um, of what's going on here. So, Think of it this way. At the end of this page, what do I know? Like, what do I know and why do I know that I should keep reading? We don't really know all that much. We know she's on a, in a construction site. We know there's a car pulling up to an old building and there's bad weather going on. That's sort of all that we know, right? It's, it's written in a way that's trying to make it maybe more compelling right. than 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 it is at the moment which is fine all we're going to really need to do is make sure that we have more content that we have more um we have more plot we have more story within it because the description's fine it can pull us in um with and i'm going to ask you to maybe mix it up a little bit more so that it's not the same sort of style throughout because we can start to fade as we're reading it so let me give an example. Okay. So let's just let's just start with this bit here. So hurricane weather, violent surf breaks against the rocks of the shoreline. A wind turbine is battered by the elements. There's no real reason for these to be three different paragraphs here, right? Um, the, the you could probably say the same thing in like one sentence, really. And in that way, you paint that picture more quickly, and. Because we're not say- if we were saying new things with each of those paragraphs, fair enough. Like if each one of those new paragraphs was a new insight or a new like uh, pulls us further into the plot, fair enough. But if you look at the content of these three lines, right? There's not we're not really adding to the story. We're just sort of stretching out the description. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. That's the challenge that we often have in this kind of a in this kind of a situation because you want to pull them through and build the tension, but we have to make sure that we're always saying something. We always have to make sure that we're um, that we're painting a picture. the 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 whole first page, the reader's trying to figure out what's going on. Why do I care? My phone's ringing. There's ten other scripts on the on the thing. Why why am I going to keep reading this and and stop reading that? And just interesting description isn't really isn't really enough, right? I need to know what's happening. Um, so when we jump into here, 
We introduce R Ruth. Um, so she's the police. That could probably be highlighted a little bit more strongly um, so that it's clear. This, this, it's a police car. What's that? Just a bit clearer that it's a police police car. On well, page. so the thing is, we're I, here. Here's the thing. It's all uh, the the issue always is context, right? So yes, you have the police car, and I would say you say parks up. Is that a is that a Scottish phrase? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a UK. <laughs> okay. I, don't know. I just. That's just what I wrote. I <laughs> no, that's fine. Because um, uh, in America, we'd say pulls up, right? So, okay. um, which is, but again, it depends on where you're trying to sell. So if you're aiming for, for the UK market and parks up is a very common phrase, then, uh, then of course you're going to want parks up. So, but my point is you, you have this on a separate line. So it does highlight the fact that it's police, but um, I would, because of the fact that you're, the way you've written this, right, where it's a new line for not each element of the story, but each sentence of the plot, right? Each sentence of the description. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, what's happening is as I read it, my brain is thinking, here are six new things I need to know, <laughs> right? Each thing, you're, each thing, and you're highlighting it. You're putting it on its own line. So it's like hurricane weather, super important. Okay. Violent surf breaks against the rocks of the shoreline, super important. Well, why? I can't, my brain doesn't know why exactly, but okay. A wind turbine is battered by the elements, super important. I, I, do you understand what I mean? <laughs> like, because of the way it's laid out, my brain is thinking each thing is important. So by the time I see a, the police car pulls up in context, where each line is done that way, this is just now, by this point, I know these are not each super important. So police car pull, parks up doesn't seem super important now at that point either. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, it does. <laughs> okay. Um, so the so the challenge is, it's it, it could be, always remember that people when they're reading their script are going to be skimming your script or they're going yeah. to be trying to read it quickly. So she gets buried in here. Her introduction gets a little buried. Whereas if you sort of just went police car, just its own in all caps, right? Its own line. And then like do the next sentence of like screeches in whatever, right? Ruth Holloway, right. Sergeant pulls out, you know, steps out, whatever. Like we, we make a more, more of a, grand entrance for her then we're not going to miss her in the context of what we're doing here does that make sense okay yeah <laughs> um so then so we're hearing we're hearing the 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 she sees the car she hears this the hissing sound um the there's a fire she goes in um nobody's there do you do you see what I'm saying where it's not quite clear on what's what we're following? What so let me ask you this. What's going on here? Hey, let me see. Okay. Um what I was trying to do, um mm -hmm. the um I haven't actually looked at these pages for, <laughs> for a, a little while. Oh, okay. okay. So um I'm actually just going back to this screenplay to try and rewrite it so this session is actually ideal <laughs> I, I i i didn't realize how busy it looked because I'm, I'm actually looking at it with with you it looks really quite busy on the page but, but to go back to your question what i was trying to do is actually tell the audience or the reader that this is a, a thriller and mm -hmm. try to make it a little bit scary mm -hmm. and them with some active questions the initial part what i think i wanted to do was was really um, be like one of those old uh, uh, film noir movies like Mildred Pierce start with a like a quick grabber and then mm -hmm. that scene, the initial scene we go back to the, the on page like 85 mm -hmm. in a more full context so you actually get to know what it's all about mm -hmm. but maybe that's maybe not the right place to put it at the start I don't know 
No, that's 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 a not only a perfectly valid way to start a story. It's probably the best way to start a lot of kinds of stories, right? The 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 key though is that we're going to need to make sure that something happens there that makes us yeah. want to know. So, um, so. It, so the, the way that kind of a situation works is you get to the end of the story and now you have all this greater context. So when you rewatch that initial scene, you now see all the other forces at play in that scene, right? Now, yeah. let me ask you, yeah. it, it, in light of that, based on this story that you've written, what are we going to, what are we going to see in that first, can you guys read it? In that first um, like teaser... What are we going to see that uh, that we're not seeing this first time? Or what's the greater context that's going to add that dimension oh. of meaning to it? Okay, the, uh, the, there is a, a kind of showdown uh, that on the construction site. Okay. And uh, she finds out that someone who um, she she wasn't who's quite close to her happens to be involved in this mystery. Mm -hmm. And the first scene actually is actually quite an extended action scene. Comes a proper battle with guns and um, hammers and people getting chased and violence and things. Okay. Uh, um, sorry. Well, so, yeah, so, so let, let me, but, but think of it a different way. So, yeah. You're saying that we're going to come back to this scene and we're going to see this scene from a new vantage point and we're going to have a, more clarity on what this is, right? So I guess yeah. what's, the, what's the added drama that we'll see the second time on, on, this, on this scene? Yeah, that's a good point. It really, it was just to, for the audience to, to know that it was coming back here. And, okay. Uh, I think so, yeah. Um, and she realizes this person is involved in this killing or mystery yeah and yeah okay so so it sounds like what so it sounds like what you're aiming for here is to have that initial moment that builds up to this this really tense dramatic like cliffhanger type moment and that when we yeah. come back to this moment it's still going to build up to that cliffhanger moment but we're now yeah. going to understand who she is and where yeah. she's at and and what that means. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. so in order for that to work, then right. this scene is going to have to build to an actual crescendo, right? So uh, yeah. so all that's really happening here is that she's trembling, she's about she aims her gun and the lights go out, right? <laughs> so right. it's not it's fine, but in order to grab us on page one, and it might be fine for your story. I don't, I, obviously, I don't know the whole story, so I don't know the larger context. But just in principle, as I read this for the first time through, I'm looking for what is that heightened dramatic moment. And in general, I would argue that pretty much all screenwriting, all stories, uh, we, we really want to zero in on what's the most dramatic aspect of this moment, of this scene, of these characters, of these characters' lives, etc. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. So don't just use it as a gimmick, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I see that quite often, actually, where people are, you know, maybe using a nonlinear storyline or they're, you know, calling up scenes from other parts of the story, what have you. And it's, it's, it's done for interest or it's done to be clever, but it's not really done to tell this story in its most effective way. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah. yeah. So as long as you're not using it, if if you think that way of not using it as a gimmick or as a narrative device, but think of it as how can I extract maximum audience emotion out of this, right? How can I pull the audience in? Then what's going to happen is not only is the device going to work, but it's actually going to be the best possible way to draw them into the story, right? So it's the best way to tell this particular project. If you if you take out the gimmick and put in the the purpose, the reason, the 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 the, the greater drama, the greater narrative drama, yeah, does it sort of make sense? Yeah. 
Um, it does. It makes sense. Okay, so when you so then the other thing is when you go from this and then you go to three weeks earlier, the the challenge always of going to three yeah. weeks earlier is that we need to have the what three weeks earlier is going to have to explain what we just saw. The reason we're going to go three weeks earlier is like, hey, here's the story that sets up what you just saw. We're going to make that assumption when we see three weeks earlier. It, we may go to a part of the story that has nothing to do with that. Um, there's lots of different ways to play around with that device, but that's where the reader's brain is going to go. So if I don't have a specific, um, if I don't have a specific hook to hang my my thinking on at that point. Then when I go to three weeks earlier, I'm like, did I miss something, right? So then the challenge of that becomes then you start reading the next bit a little bit off step. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah. Uh, so, then, so then we have to be really clear on um, setup. So let me ask you this about the exterior cliffs scene here. Um, you're, yeah. you're highlighting each of those lines. Um, is there, is there, what's, is there a specific reason for it or it's just sort of your, it's just sort of the way you've, you've unfolded it? No, there, there is a, a specific reason. Um, the whole context with the weather mm -hmm. and the, the, the oil terminal is really important to the story because the, there was a the sure oil, um, this actually controlled in terms of the story, sure oil actually owned most of the island, but they have rerouted their, their pipelines to Europe and a new age or a new earth energy company sees an opportunity to move in and buy up some land. So that's really important to the actual plot overall. Okay, so what I was actually trying to do, I guess, and was probably get that sort of idea in there right away. And I was probably writing that Jeff, more or less for myself, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Just try to get, okay, this is, the weather is important to the, the story and the, the history with sure oil on the island is actually important to the story. And all of that may or may not be involved, uh, mixed up with Sergeant Ruth Alloway's murder or shooting. So... Um, so you know, I, it's probably I, I, I do appreciate what you're saying there. Well, so you're saying that she's about to get murdered? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because uh, she's sort of checking out the Cortina car, uh, and then she she there's the the distraction with the storehouse, and I think I was just trying to sort of kind of make a nice little correction of scenes to build up some tension where she mm -hmm. goes into the main building and she hears the noise with the door squeaking and everything and she knows someone's there and the audience knows someone is there mm. and then there's there's gunshots and then we were left on the sort of active question as the driver pulls away in the cartina car who who is this guy or this who is this person and why is this shooting taking place okay so it's actually kind of all, okay sorry no, okay. So the so where it's where it's uh bang bang bang, that's actually yeah. her getting shot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So it's so so I just there's there's a number of things to unpack in all this, but the so she steps forward and is uh enveloped by darkness. The door continues to squeak and squeak suddenly a flash followed by the sound of rapid gunfire, bang, bang, bang. Um we don't necessarily know that it's not her shooting, right? Or someone like there's no we don't there's no way for us to know that she's the one that gets hit. You want that? That's on, that's intentional, right there. Or... Yeah, it was. Yeah, because the next cut is to the army boots um, stopping across the yard, and there's the gloves on the the Cartina driver's door, so we don't okay. see the driver. They get in the car, and then they pull away across, and it's mm -hmm. like. The deliberate was the car drives past her police patrol car. So we know whoever is in the car, the white Christina car, is responsible for the gunshots, probably. And then okay. it cuts to our flashlight, which she was using earlier on. And it's just the image of the flashlight 
on the floor and then the sound of a radio in the background somewhere. Then it cuts into the main story, really, or the main character, which okay. is Beth. So this is one of those situations where I feel like there's the, there's probably more here than the reader's going to get, right? Yeah. So everything that you've described sounds like a perfectly fine way to to start up a story like this. So the Perfect. challenge in part is that the way you're pulling us into it, you're you're throwing images at us that in our mind don't necessarily add up to the picture that you see in your mind, right? And this is one of the biggest challenges of, of creative writing in general. Yeah. So don't don't fret about this. This is this is the lifelong struggle to learn how to do. But uh, the, the way that I always like to put it is you is uh, I, I refer to this thing called image order. I've talked about it in the previous sessions or whatever. Uh, it, it's about uh, always remember that the that the reader's a blank canvas, right? So every word you write is going to put a picture in their head, and going to that picture is going to make them anticipate other pictures. And then the other things that you write either serve and flesh out and build and expand that picture or it gets further and further off the mark of what they were expecting it to be, or it, it doesn't jibe, right? So, uh, and it's not just in the words you choose, it's also in how you lay those words out on the page. Yes. So, yes. Um, so as I've been saying with those, with those sentences, right? So we have that all kind of throughout here. So in general, what I'm gonna, what we want to do is what's the most important thing for them to understand it, it, in its most simplified version. It's this, it's this cop pulling up to this abandoned old uh, oil terminal, which is what, uh, yeah. like a pumping station, like a, they're pulling oil out of the ground or it's a refinery or what is it? That's oil terminal. It's more like uh, oil storage, oil storage place. Okay, so like big barrels of oil, that kind of a thing, oil or like tanks, yeah, yeah. big oil tanks, yeah, and big oil tanks. Okay. Um, so I feel like what we probably need to do is it, the thing that I'm, I, I, I think you're probably going to want to do is the first things first. So if you want to do, <laughs> if you want to go and improve these pages, right? The first thing we want to do is make sure that teaser has some big thing in it. Right, something that becomes a hook, mm -hmm. something unusual, something uh, unexpected, some danger situation, and I don't know what the climax of your story is, where this actually goes from here. So you know, it may need an element that's not currently in your story, or it may need something, mm -hmm. or you may need to reveal something that is there that's cool, that's a good, good sort of twist or a, the setup for the twist. Um, and introduce that early on, but something that's going to hook us like, whoa, this is, this is weird. This is, this is, you know, a, a tense little thing. Uh, that's what's going to need to happen here. Then here, the most important thing is making sure that we see that the cop gets killed. We see that the shadow figure gets away in the Cortina and we really establish that this is a dilapidated old oil factory, right? Those are the main, the main points to, to get across, right? Yeah. So yeah. every, everything that you write needs to, needs to serve that, needs to pull us into that story, that world. Don't get carried away with unnecessary description. Um, if the weather is important, that's fine, but it's going to be better to, to paint the picture quickly because all we really need to do is go torrential rain pours down on a yeah. dilapidated yeah. old um, oil yeah. storage unit. <laughs> and yeah, then I, that's it, right? <laughs> so you mentioned tension and you wanted to build up the tension of the thing. The only way that the reader uh, is going to feel or experience tension is if they care about the people in the story who are experiencing the tension. So sure. okay. this first scene, I, 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 I say this as respectfully as I can, it doesn't have any tension to it. Uh, right. Not because it couldn't, but because we don't know who Beth is and we don't, like, 
You haven't given us a reason to care yet. So what the old adage is, you know, um, uh, make the character really good at something, make the character really funny, put them in peril, right? So you, right. you think she's put in peril, but that's really what the whole end of the thing is, right? We don't really know yeah. she's in peril. <laughs> so by the time we've experienced this, there's no, there's no tension here, right? So just sort of describing the scene or the situation isn't going to, uh, isn't going to give us that isn't going to give us that sense of tension. So always, we want to always make sure that we're, we're writing about characters in a situation. Like that's the, that's almost the dominant or the predominant um, um, purpose behind the writing. Characters first, <laughs> situation second, in, in order of importance, right? We can okay. set this little world but if we don't know who the character is and what the situation is, we're, it doesn't matter how nicely described it is, it's not gonna work for us. Does that make sense? Right. Yes, it does. Cool. Uh, and I'm probably gonna say that makes sense a lot, but that's just my way of, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure it does. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think there's, I think there's a possibility here. I think there's, a, there's, there's you know, certainly the potential if you want to go uh, and sort of um, tighten it up or, or simplify it, and the other thing to understand is if you do what I'm describing and you make those three pages much simpler and you, um, and you uh, pull us into who the character is and what the situation is more clearly, you're going to have a lot more time in these three pages to give us more, um, uh, to give us more interesting yeah. um, situation or detail, right? So... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you you know what I mean. So yeah. rather than sort of all this, do that in one paragraph, and then you have more time to uh, for those details yeah. that make us go, oh, what's this? Now, the only other thing that I wanted to say was just writing style. Um, be aware of, this sounds like a silly thing, but be aware of when each paragraph has sort of the same look and size, right? So this is one line, this is one line, this is half a line, this is two, 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 one, two, one, one, half, one, uh, two, one, you know what I mean? So the, the, ch the, the problem is um, it gets visually repetitive. So it, uh, that will contribute to the reader missing details. So I probably read these pages three times before it fully hit me, of like before I fully understood. And your detail's there. It's not okay. like this is confusing. <laughs> but it, it's, um, if it's not, if it's not, you'll notice that when we watch movies or TV or watch YouTube videos today, everything's like cut, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Why is that? That's because it's, it's our brain gets bored really quickly and so when we see something that's visually repetitive we we fade unless what's in that is rich and compelling and the detail within that one frame you watch something like um three billboards or something like that you, you know you watch a movie like that and it's it's fat just the little facial gestures on francis mcdormand's face or they speak volumes and so we don't need to cut 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 because there's enough there we got to yeah. make sure there's enough there does that make sense yeah it does yeah yeah, yeah. Um, um go ahead no it was just um it's been a, a little while since I've, I've, I've really read over these pages and i'm quite um surprised how busy they look how what how busy they look, how they busy. look busy yeah hmm. and i have to just as a little confession i had been reading uh, i think a little bit too influenced by a walter hill script i read called driver the driver mm -hmm. and he did a lot of in that particular screenplay a lot of his scenes are almost like little lists of like sentences and i think that's sort of crept into <laughs> right. yeah so there's definitely something like that going on but yeah I absolutely agree there's I'm, I'm using up far too much real estate on the page with 
unnecessary with, with unnecessary detail. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, we we ultimately want to have literally every single word really but at least every single sentence be absolutely okay. crucial and add to the story right so it's not just about describing right so like a novelist can take you know a chapter just to describe the sensation of swimming or something right like it doesn't necessarily pull the story forward but just the description of it pulls the reader in and we get into that headspace movies are different right screenplays yeah. are all about just uh, just just tell us what we need to know to understand the picture we're watching. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and then and and I would say like decorate it, paint it a little bit for flourish, right? For just to make sh make those ideas um, visceral and tangible and palpable. Yeah, give it a yeah. little which, twist. Which you've got some of that in here. So uh, I, I like I said, I really like that. I really like this initial introduction. There's a. <laughs> I almost feel like, yeah, I almost feel like this is, it needs to be its own sentence or something. There's something in it that, that's, that jumbles the, the read when you read it the first time, you know? Yeah, I'll tell you what it is. We're seeing her. We're describing her. Fine. We're uh -huh. seeing her in this moment. But then we're finishing up the action that she's doing right now. Yeah, right? okay. Yeah, so the description's in with what she's doing at that moment. Yeah. Well, so it, it's it's basically like four four or five things we're trying to grasp in one fluid sentence, and so it, it makes the sentence not fluid. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, so, yes. yeah, hopefully that makes sense. It does, um, yeah. Cool. All right, so is there anything else you wanted to sort of talk about or ask or discuss on this, these pages? No, thank you. Um, like I say, it's, um, I'm really going to get to work in the next month or two on, on rewriting. I have, a, I have a, a draft. I have a sort of first draft. I actually sent it off to – it wasn't really ready, but uh, obviously, but I sent it off to Blue Cat um, Screenplay Competition because you get, you get notes. Uh -huh. um, and they gave me some good uh, feedback. A lot of like the in terms of the story, they quite enjoyed the plot and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They weren't uh, um, in depth in terms of um, about my formatting or in description, but they, they they found the plot quite engaging and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the main the main sort of feedback they gave me in terms of the overall screenplay was that my uh, main character didn't get going quick enough. She's a mm -hmm. journalist, but she doesn't really start to hit her prime until about halfway through the through the, the script. And I think that was because I had quite a lot of plot to set up. And I think she got a little bit lost in the first half of it. But um, right. I, I didn't feel awful. The good thing about Blue Cat is I think you can rewrite your script and resubmit it. So yep. hopefully try and do that in the next month or two, mate. So get to work on it sure well what i would like to do with the show as well is uh if you want if you if you end up rewriting these pages or if you want yeah. to rewrite these pages what i do want to do as we move along with this is maybe you know have another look at the pages sort of at the end of a of a future episode so oh, you mean when it's being rewritten yeah if you want to do that yeah. and then we can sort of you know knowing what this was we can go back and revisit yeah. those three pages oh, and get cool. a sense of yeah, yeah. be up for yeah. that Cool. cool. So that's, uh, and that's sort of anyone who's watching or anyone who's, uh, wants to, uh, send in pages to get reviewed for this. Um, same thing. So I'd be happy to, I guess, loop <laughs> through the feedback and sort of use that as yeah. a way to help you, um, help you improve and see if we can address some of those specific points that we talked about. So that's, that's, that is open to you if you want to do it. <laughs> cool. All right. So let me, uh, I'm going to thank you very much, by the way, Eddie. We appreciate you, that. It's always, it's always, uh, you're always putting yourself out there when you're, when you're, um, um, when you're, when you're putting your, putting your words on the, on the screen for other people to review and potentially. Thanks uh, for, thanks for your stuff. feedback. No worries. So I'm going to switch you back to uh, an attendee. So hopefully this makes sense to everybody. If, does anybody have any specific questions about uh, about those pages or about what we talked about in that? What I also want to do is uh, introduce a new sort of feature to this uh, where 
I want to go over maybe the first three pages of some existing scripts that are maybe well regarded. Uh, so to that end, because Eddie uh, wrote some uh, wrote an action thriller sort of thing, I wanted to uh, read the first three pages to you from the script Logan, which was actually nominated for uh, best adapted screenplay, I believe. Uh, is it original or adapted? Anyway, I think it was uh, an adapted screenplay. It's the it's the Wolverine, um, it's the Wolverine uh, thing. But in doing this, my hope is to help you um, see how uh, someone introduces a lot of information and a lot of insight into uh, what's happening in a scene and pulls you into that itself. So before we do that. Uh, Debbie has asked a question. Let's see, you asked Eddie, why do we care about the cop who gets killed? What would help achieve that? Would something as easy as a line of dialogue help, i.e. she's on her cell and says something interesting? Possibly. Um, just something to make her real, or alternately, a little more action, like Shane Black does in page one of Lethal Weapon on page one just before the girl jumps out of the window. There's possibly that as well. The um, having us care about what's happening to the character on page one can be a little bit difficult because we haven't really had a chance yet to, to meet them, to know about them. But if the first thing that we see a character doing or they're, or they're, or they're in a situation that we can see that it matters to them at least, uh, then we're going to have more empathy for that character. If we see that they're good at something or maybe in a situation that's out of their depth and um, there's something about the way they're handling it that is engaging. So if somebody, let's, uh, I don't want to say you want to make every character funny because you don't, but as an example, let's imagine a character is on page one thrust into a situation that they can't handle and they they make a sort of joke about how they're they're not going to make it through this because this is ridiculously challenging. Like right away, we're going to care about them, right? Because right away, they're a likable character. Right away, they're somebody we can relate to. So when a character is out of their depth and there's a reason why they care about it, we'll care about it too. If it's just a character in some sort of, think about a, a horror film where you've got the character <laughs> going into the woods or the character creeping along the, the hallway at night and there's strange noises coming from the other. We don't really care. They're usually an expendable character in the beginning of a horror film just to set up the horror genre thing, right? So why are they expendable? Because we don't know them. We don't care about them. We, we, nothing's happened yet to make us interested in them. But if there's some scene right before that where the character's trying to get into college or uh, the character needs to, you know, save up money for, you know, bailing their mother out of jail, I don't know, <laughs> whatever it might be, um, then we can we can care about that character in a more um, in a more human way. Think about why you care about anybody. Um, we care about people that we know. We care about people that uh, whose whose future we're invested in. And so I'm not sure that you can always do that on page one. The cop going in and getting killed. We're not necessarily going to care about the cop. But what we probably do need to care about in in uh, Eddie's pages is that first character on page one, the character in the construction site. So the sister, presumably. There, we want to, we're gonna to want to know this character and, and care about this character right off the bat. So they're gonna to need to do something or say something or, or be something that pulls us in. Does that make sense? So Debbie's, got, Debbie's question is, did everyone but me recognize the two characters had the same last name in Eddie's script? Debbie, are you saying you didn't recognize that? Because I didn't recognize that the first time through. So keep in mind, I've read these a couple times through because I don't want to stumble as I read through them on these live sessions. But uh, the notes that I'm giving are generally related to how I felt on the first read through. And then maybe additional notes and additional thoughts and ideas based on subsequent read throughs and whether it comes together or not. If, it's, if something comes together on the second or third read through, 
that that means it's it's not bad. It's got some things that are good about it. The the detail is there. But always remember when it comes to screenwriting, the, the reader has to understand what's going on and care the very first time they read your script. So I make a bunch of notes the first time I read through these and I notice where I stumble and I notice where I've um, tripped over the words uh, so that I so that I can help so that I can pinpoint where those problems are. If I'm reading a script for consideration, if I'm reading a script to think about sending off to somebody else, uh, um, the, the first time through is the only time through, right? So if something is not clear the first time through, as I believe you're right about the, the two last names, um, then that's going to get missed and that project will probably need to be rewritten or redeveloped or refined to make sure that it actually works. Sound good? All right, so let's have a look at the, the first three pages from the script, Logan. This is an Oscar-nominated screenplay. Uh, it's got a couple of things in this script that we're, uh, that we're not going to do as first time writers or as or as writers who are uh, writing on spec. So there's a few little notes in here that we're going to talk about. So let's have a look at this. An LCD billboard with defective pixels, a beautiful couple dance on a giant can of a Red Bull like drink, Hypno, the label morphs to different flavors. Exterior a vacant lot night, colored light from the billboard flickers over a bullet riddled sign, Route 85, US border El Paso, Texas. Beneath the sign is a long black limousine, cars whip past on the highway, then a van passes, blasting some future version of techno Latino hip hop, a squeal of tires off screen. Now the music gets louder as the van returns, cruising slowly past the black limo before pulling into the lot. Five bangers bail out and check out the black stretch. The limo doors are locked, windows tinted, so they can't see what's inside, but they check out the tires and wheels and like what they see. With the speed of a pit crew, they open the back of the van and out come tools and a jack. Interior, limo, same. We move over the back bench, past empty bottles, fast food wrappers, and a sleeping man's face ratchets into frame. He opens his red eyes. The man is Logan, a.k.a. the Wolverine, or more accurately, drunk Wolverine. He blinks, dazed, feeling the car lurching upward. Older than we've seen him, he clutches a tequila bottle. Exterior limo, El Paso highway turnout, night. As the back door opens, the tequila bottle drops to the dirt and a booted leg steps out. Logan shuffles stiff to the other side of the stretch where the bangers work, removing wheels lit by colored light. Logan, uh, please stop guys. Those, those are chrome plated lugs. They all five turn. Some pull guns on the drunk limo driver. He just keeps talking, slurring some. Logan, you're going to strip him, plating flakes off, you know. A jittery banger cocks his shotgun. First of all, notice on page one, we already are right into the action. There's no excessive description. Literally everything that we've read so far is setting up this, this scene, this situation. We see the fullness of the scene. There's no confusion about what's going on. There's no confusion about who's who. Now, we do already know who Logan is from previous Wolverine movies, and they're about to do something that I'm going to very strongly recommend against you doing. But... Um, uh, but we, we have this picture, even if we didn't know Wolverine, if we did, even, even if we didn't know Logan, um, we still understand what's going on here, right? A guy in the back, a drunk guy in the back of a limo is getting his, his w limo stripped. Logan, it's a lease, you know, and no one wants to pay to ride in a, the jittery banger fires, blows Logan right off his feet. Logan, fuck. Now might be a good time to talk about fights described in the next hundred or so pages. Basically, if you're on the make for a hyper-choreographed, gravity-defying, city-block-destroying CG fuckathon, this ain't your movie. In this flick, people will get hurt or killed when shit falls on them. They will get just as hurt or just as killed if they get hit with something big and heavy like, say, a car. Should anyone in our story have the misfortune to fall off a roof or out a window, they won't bounce. They will die. As for our hero with the so-called eternal life and healing, well, he's older now. If you keep reading, you'll discover Logan's about to get his ass kicked. But before we get to that, we should make it clear his abilities ain't what they were. Yes, he's a drunk, but he's also fading on the inside. 
adamantium implants leaching into his system, causing chronic pain and diminished healing, hence booze as a painkiller. So by all means, go ahead and worry about him. Now, where were we? Oh yeah. As the smoke settles, a crowbar-toting banger angrily chews out jitters in Spanish for firing. The others resume their work, none aware of Logan slowly getting up, till Logan, guys, seriously, gets to his feet. You don't want to do this. The bangers react to Logan with bafflement, ad lib Spanish reactions, nervous chuckles. Crowbar presses down Jitter's gun as he moves to Logan. We hear a familiar snicked as claws slowly extend from one of Logan's hands, then mostly extend from the other. Logan is still frowning at his bad hand when Crowbar thwacks his skull, a metallic ring. Off balance and pissed, Logan swings at them as they converge, but he's drunk and soon they are pounding him with knives and guns and fists and a torque wrench. He tries his best to keep them from the limo, catches one guy's bat an inch before it would dent the car. Another one of them shoots in that direction, but Logan puts himself in front of the bullet. The pain from that little move stops him long enough for them to resume zoom the pummeling. Suddenly, Logan's eyes go yellow, pupils dilating. He lets out a long, loud yell. Fury rockets up in him like cocaine. He stands and rams his claws into crowbar and kicks another banger into the back of the open van. Yet another runs at Logan only to get gored in the neck and tossed. This is real work for Logan, not easy, and it is fueled by rage. Jitters again raises his sawed off. He will nail the car for sure, but Logan slices off his arm above the elbow. Sadly for Logan, the hand, while disconnected from the body it once belonged to is still holding the gun. So as it hits the dirt, the gun goes off, putting several pellet-sized holes in the door of the limo. This, more than anything else, doubles Logan anger. Mother f- who gets hit once more? And then goes after the last banger, seeing it he had his chance, leaps into the van and spins out of the lot, his wounded compadre in back spilling onto the dirt as the van bounces back onto the road. Logan picks up his keys, some loose change and a single silver bullet. He stands staring into the holes in his otherwise pristine stretch as rain begins to fall. He sucks in deep breaths, forcing himself to regain control. His eyes return to normalcy. The phone vibrates OS. Uh, Logan takes out his, looks at it. He's got a fair kicks the jack from under the chassis. We crane up as Logan starts up the stretch and makes a loop in the lot, taking care to run over the three remaining bangers before laying rubber onto the highway. Main titles begin. Okay, so a couple things that we don't want to do in, uh, a couple things we don't want to do in, um, in a spec script. Now, keep in mind, this is, as we see here, the final shooting script. Uh, final shooting script is going to have some, um, uh, possibly, it's usually going to have input from the director, from some of the crew, perhaps. Um, so you're often going to have things like camera angles. Generally speaking, it's not that you can't put camera angles in your script. It's that it's kind of the lazy way to do it, and you're telling the director how to do their job, which directors often don't like. So in general, in principle, we want to, um, we want to avoid that kind of a thing, but this is a final shooting script. So it's going to be a little different to, to an actual script. Now let's talk about this little, um, writer talking to reader bit. This is Logan. So this is part of the Wolverine series. This is a sequel. This is a film in a franchise that already exists that is going to get made. This is written either on assignment or on spec by people who are connected to that world. Uh, This is not This is not the kind of spec script that you are generally going to write if you're writing a script to try to subsequently sell it. So, while this kind of thing works in a Shane Black script, (laughs) this kind of thing works in a Logan script, this kind of thing can work, but it's very, very risky. If you do this kind of an aside to the reader, you had better be able to back it up with something that is worthy of getting nominated for an Oscar. Okay, so in general, I'm going to recommend against it. Now, that said, the way this these pages were done is all about helping the reader understand what's going on, helping the reader understand tone and style and detail, right? It's basically saying this isn't just another CG 
you know, people bounce off walls and nobody ever really gets hurt. This is actual, the texture of this is going to be more real. Now, ideally, they should do that in the, in the words that are written. They should do that. If you're going to do that in your script, you need to do that in, within the writing style, within the word choice, within the way you make the action play out. But these guys can get away with it. So this is the challenge also of looking at scripts that you find on the internet <laughs> because, and professional scripts and scripts of movies that you've seen. Oftentimes, you're not reading a spec version of the script. You're reading the final shooting script. Oftentimes, you're, um, you're, not, you're also reading something that writers may know the people who they're writing for so they can put things into their script. If you're writing, reading something from a writer director or somebody like Tarantino, they're going to write what they want because they know they're going to be the one directing it. They don't have to go out and try to pitch it or sell it, right? They do, but they have a proven track record so they can get away with things. So as a new writer, as a spec writer, we want to make sure that you are it's your words, it's your imagery, it's your the way you lay the plot out on the page and the way you pull the, the reader through the story. Now, that said, ultimately, if we look at these pages, um, those pages do it really well. So if you think about the, the words, this first page, there's no, there's no asides to, to the to the to the reader this is if you wrote a spec script and it had this kind of a, a start that's a solid start it's a great start um we go straight into you know the the this is an action start we see our character we see our character being uh the underdog we see other people trying to take advantage of him we see him coming back at something we see bullet holes in his pristine limo we don't know why that's important but we see that he reacts to it so it's important in some way does that make sense so we want to make sure that as we there's a if you look at you know i'm always talking about sort of white space and and sort of <laughs> a reader when a reader opens up a page and it's got all this text on it <laughs> right and they see the next, next page oh it's got all this text on it oh the next page has got all this there's a lot of reading in this script right but if i get into the first you know three paragraphs and it's all beautifully visual and it's all pulling me into the story and i can tell this is going to be an entertaining read in its own right i'm happy to read the big blocks of text does that make sense so this is just an example of how a, a, a great action scene or, or how to start with an action opener or with something that's pulling us in with tension and with uh, drama like that. At the end of the day, the, 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 the goal with all screenwriting is to put that cinematic experience in the mind, in the imagination of the reader as they read the pages of your screenplay. If we can do that, then they're going to experience the movie. So it's not about, it's not about uh, painting a nice picture or, or um, using any sort of gimmicks along the way. What we really want to do is we want to think about sitting around a campfire. <laughs> think about telling that story. We want to draw the reader in and we want to pull them through. So let's see, Metin asks, but even when you remove those comments to the reader, isn't the script very wordy, even though clear, which we wouldn't have the luxury of? No, that, so I, I, I think I kind of answered the question before I saw that you had asked it, um, Metin. But uh, the point is not that you don't have, the point is not that you don't want to be wordy. The point is that you want every word you write to paint the picture quickly, efficiently, move the story forward, and give us the cinema experience. The thing about this first page of the Logan script is that's about a minute of screen time. It's the, we see the billboard with the flickering lights, we see the cars on the highway, we see the, we see the, the, the limo, we hear the music in the van, the van pulls up, the guys jump out, they, they look at this limo, they go get all their stuff, they start, you know, pulling things off it, and then we're inside the limo, we see him but waking up in his days, <laughs> the, the, the alcohol or whatever it is, he sort of falls out the side of the thing and we're right into the action. That's all that's in there on page one, but it's written in such a way that you see that movie. And that's kind of the goal that we're trying to achieve here. So it doesn't necessarily mean there aren't sleeker, slimmer ways to convey the same thing, but 
there are a million ways. There's no right or wrong. I've said it before. I'll say it a thousand times again. Uh, there is no right or wrong. There's no, this is better than that. There's no, um, you know, the, there's no saying that they made the best choice or the right choice. Um, they made a choice that was effective. They made a choice that worked. And as a result, it pulls us into the story. Now, because this is an action story, an action story needs to have action. So we're going to need to describe the action, which they do very well in that script. So uh, we also want to always understand what we're writing. What's the genre we're writing? What's the, um, uh, what's, what's the audience for this? What is the audience expecting in this kind of story? An audience in a Lo for, to a Logan movie is going to want to see clever, interesting action scenes. So we're going to need to make sure that we have those descriptions. And it's not just about describing the... It's not about describing the frame, right? It's really about describing the action within the frame. That's the goal that we're aiming for, is pulling the reader into the story and making them care about the story and the characters and what's happening to whom, okay? All the sort of description of that, what the, what the color of the curtains look like and all that kind of stuff is not necessary. It's not relevant unless it is. Make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Let me have a quick look at the chat box to see if we have anything that we're uh, missing. Let's see. Um, Debbie says, I adore these pages and no, I'm not Scott Frank, but the pages are clear and interesting. If we're constantly told to make our scripts great and that there are no, no rules, no right or wrong, then why can't we do our own version of rule breaking like this in our own script? Do you really think it is going to be a turnoff to you as a reader if the story is compelling, interesting, and well done? Would you absolutely have put down Logan if it were from me? No. And this is my point. Um, my point is not that you can't do it. There are lots of scripts that do it, even from unknown writers. My point is that it's risky. What that does when you're do, when you do the aside from the writer to the reader not to the keep in mind a, a screenplay is literally the cinema experience on the page so when i read the script it should be as though i'm watching the movie in the theater in my mind in my imagination right so any writers aside anything any little clever quip that the writer puts in there to the reader they're not put, you're not putting that on the movie. You're not, that's not going to, that, that little block of text is not going to go in the movie itself. So because it's not going to go in the movie itself, you're pulling me out of the movie to give me this little writer's aside. I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm saying that's really risky. I'm saying that if you can't pull that off, and you don't know for a fact you can pull that off, you have more a chance of pissing the reader off than you do of having the intended effect. That does not mean you can't do it. <laughs> there are no rules. There really aren't. Um, I've seen people get away with all sorts of stuff. The, the, the challenge that I always have, in particular when you try to teach this kind of stuff, is if I teach you the writer a side thing and then you go out and you misuse it, you piss off your reader, <laughs> then ultimately um, I've, I've led you astray, right? It's, it's like camera directions. It's, you, you will see lots and lots of scripts that say, we pan across whatever, or we zoom out to see or to reveal. These are, these are directorial notes. These are details that don't actually belong in a script. But... They can, There's, it works. In a lot of cases, it's going to be the most effective way to paint the picture in the reader's mind. What I'm suggesting is that as a writer, your job is to paint the picture with words, not with gimmicky cheats, right? So if you can, cre if you can paint that picture with words, then I'm going to be double dazzled. So uh, let me give you an example here. Let me jump back over to it because there's a, there's a, there's a, Great example right here. Here you go. So exterior limo, El Paso highway turnout night. As the back door opens, the tequila bottle drops to the dirt and a booted leg steps out. I want you to think about that line for a second. We don't need to say, 
close up on the sh- on the boot hitting the dirt our mind is already imagining a low angle shot right at the dirt level where the boot drops into the frame right that's what our mind is imagining because of the word choice right so th- you don't have to use a camera angle you don't have to describe something or do an aside to the reader here to let them know that that's what the picture is that you're seeing. You just describe it in a way that they have to see that camera angle because of the way you wrote those words. I would argue that that is going to be the mark of a better writer than the writer who says close on boot as it hits the dirt, right? Same thing but one it one has a better way with words and the other one is using the cheat which may not always but may annoy a director because if a director sees that shot the writer's telling them how to shoot their their story right and a lot of directors will go through and go yep i'm using a different shot than that how can i how can i reimagine this so that it's my vision and not the writer's vision now a lot of directors are not going to do that but there will be those that do and so can we avoid that? If we can avoid that, I, I would argue that we should. As, as a writer, I, your, your, your job is to paint the picture with the words. And if you paint the picture with the words, then we usually won't need the kind of writer asides that are there. Sometimes you might want to have them there because they're fun or that's a kind of a funny inside joke. Be aware that they do pull the reader out of the story. Imagine you're watching a movie and you see a boom drop into the shot, right? Uh, Or you you go past the storefront and you see the crew and the reflection in the the window. What does it do? It breaks you, pulls you right out of the movie. Whatever emotional investment you had in that scene, just spotting that, you you see outside the frame. It's no longer this immersive experience in this story, right? It's the... It, it suddenly you're aware of the movie making, which just that just that little bit can pull you out of the emotional experience of it. So if the next scene is supposed to build in crescendo, or maybe this scene is supposed to build in crescendo emotionally, you're not going to get there emotionally because you notice that thing. That's why they do go to great pains to take to make sure that there's no booms in the shot or that there's no reflection of the camera crew. Similarly, in a screenplay, I would argue that we should go to the same. Um, lengths to make sure that we don't have um, that we don't have those kinds of things that are going to pull the reader out of the story. Okay, so again, that said, <laughs> um, you are free to do whatever you like. <laughs> You're always free to make use of those kinds of techniques. Um, just make sure you can back it up. So, and and I would argue that most writers can't. I would argue that most time in spec scripts. Um, the, the spec scripts are the people that are trying to get noticed, right? So a lot of the scripts that you read of movies that have been made, the writer knew the director, the writer knew the producer, the writer's agents, the writer and the producer's agent were the same. So they've met at cocktail parties, blah, blah, blah. They might want to do those kinds of inside jokes or, or they might want to do things that they get away with because it's fun, because it's, <laughs> it entertains them while they're reading the script, whatever. Um, it's a, it's a different it's a different reality to the writer trying to break in. It's a different reality to the writer trying to get noticed and say, hey, uh, my, my story is awesome. My movie's cool. So hopefully that makes sense. Cool. All right. So are there any other questions about any of the stuff? Do you guys like the idea of reading a, a, an existing script? Um, is it, I don't mean for it to be a counterpoint to the other script because they're obviously two different scripts, uh, totally different writers, totally different situations. Um, so it's not about... Um, uh, it's not about um, comparison. It's really about showing, it's really about helping you. I, I want to try to, through the course of the series, I want to try to uh, help you see, help you see what works and what doesn't and why and understand how readers read the scripts so that you understand what the reader's thinking as they're reading your words. 
it's really hard to see that objectively until someone else points it out to you. Eddie was talking about how he hasn't read the script in, in a little while, and so now he's looking at it now, and it looks really busy to him now. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it, it, it's hard to, to see it objectively until you are watching it, <laughs> watching me talk through it with other people watching me talk through it. You'll, you'll see your own work a whole lot more objectively uh, after you've been through that. So if you, do have script, if you do have pages that you want me to review in an upcoming session, please go ahead and um, uh, click on the email link or whatever's on the website where you see this uh, and, uh, and send some pages in because I'm happy to review stuff and I, my, my hope is to always be uh, kind and considerate and helpful and productive to you. Uh, I'm not here to make anybody feel bad. I, I really want to help you make sure you generate the best possible story because whatever story you've got in your head, whatever idea is going through your head, whatever picture you see, there's a reason you see it. There's a reason you care about it. There's a reason you want to share it. And because of that, I think it's important for you to share it. And I think it's important for you to make sure that you share it in the best possible way. So it has the best possible chance of actually connecting with a um, producer or production company who can ultimately help you turn it into a film. The great thing about spec screenwriting is that literally you, if you write a, a great script and you really connect with the reader and you pull us in and you paint this world for us and you give us characters we care about in situations that are interesting that we, we want to see resolved. Uh, there's literally an infinite array of opportunity out there. There is so much opportunity. We can make movies anywhere on earth now. It's not just Hollywood anymore. We can, there's literally thousands, literally thousands of movies made every single year now. Um, this is a, a craft that takes a long time to learn and master and, and really do well. Um, you're probably going to see why if you stick with me through this series and, and, and we go over a variety of scripts because the problems are all similar but very different. Um, but it, it does take a, a fair bit of time, but it, that time is well spent. There's, there is enormous opportunity. There are a lot of people like me out there who are frustrated, uh, would be or would have been producers who... Um, I tell a story, I'm sorry guys who've already heard this before, but I was, uh, uh, I had this, I had this situation where I had, I was in Sydney and I had, uh, I'd been teaching screenwriting through screenplay.com.au for a long time. And this guy contacted me from Singapore. Uh, he had a group of investors in Singapore. They, they had $10 million. They wanted to make three movies. So since I taught screenwriting, surely I had three screenplays ready to go. I didn't. Writers just, writers don't follow through. Writers don't, um, they don't take the stuff on board and actually do it. And I don't mean you guys, because you guys are here watching this. Uh, you guys are here participating in this. Um, there's obviously a heightened sense of interest and, and passion for it. That's rare. I find that to be far more rare than you think. Everybody wants the get rich quick version of all this, right? Everyone, no, I always say, do you want to write a screenplay? Or do, do you want to have written a screenplay? Do you want to have one on the shelf and be able to go, look what I did, but not actually do the work of doing it? Or do you actually like getting in there and making this stuff work? You have to do that. You have to like getting in there and making this stuff work. And you'd be surprised how, how hard that is to, to truly find. So... I remain ever hopeful, ever optimistic, <laughs> ever energetic, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you guys don't see me on my off moments when I'm uh, writers. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I keep coming back for more, so there's, there's a passion for it. My goal in the beginning was to start an independent film studio. I, and I think I'm answering Kevin specifically because I don't think you're, you're not part of FAST, I don't think. Um, my goal was to start an independent film studio, make three to six films a year, started looking for screenplays in Australia to produce. Um, there was back in this late 90s, early 2000s, there was no screenwriting culture there. I would argue there still isn't, but there was definitely none then uh, and couldn't find material, just couldn't find anything like nobody wrote. I, I talked to a producer who at one of the producer conferences who the year earlier, no, two years earlier, had the highest grossing movie of all time in Australia. And I asked him how many scripts he gets 
for on spec for people to read. And he said, on average, maybe two a week. <laughs> I thought, and I said, are they any good? He's no. <laughs> so it's like, you know, even back when I started doing all this, there was, there's no, uh, there's, there was, it was a wasteland. Um, I would argue it's not a whole lot better today. And I, I don't, necessarily like to say that because I don't want to offend you guys who are I know putting in you know a lot of energy to do this stuff and to to try to do it really well but I say this to maybe emphasize and reiterate that there literally is unlimited opportunity the the the, the challenge is that the le the barrier for entry that that level at which your project has to be is is pretty high and so, um, it, and it's very obvious, hopefully we're going to see over the course of the series, it's very obvious very quickly that any number of things can cause someone to stop reading your script. And, and you know, that's, that's going to make it harder to sell and to, to get in there. And there's a lot of, this, my big challenge when I started teaching screenwriting was um, I was in Australia and there was no, uh, everything was all about writing for Hollywood. All the educational stuff, all the stuff online. Well, there was no online back then, but all this, it was all about writing for Hollywood and you can't write a Hollywood script and make it in Australia. It's just not, it's a different market. There's different sensibilities, different budget levels, different audience um, interests. All It's different, right? Same for you guys who are in different countries around the world. Um, you know, there's a huge market outside Hollywood, uh, but you can't just write a Hollywood film and hope for it to, to work. It's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We have to tell localized stories um, and tell them in a maybe more effective way, more crowd pleasing way, etc. cetera. But, um, you know, that's the, that's the big, that's the big challenge was, you know, the people that were writing stuff in, in Australia were writing for Hollywood, which we couldn't really make in Australia. Um, and, you know, to, to sell to a big studio, nowadays it's got to be a, an action hero story. <laughs> um, but there's a huge indie scene. There's a lot. Don't worry about making smaller movies. There's There are or, or personal character stories or whatever. There's, there's literally hundreds up to thousands of, of films made each year for Sundance film festival for the last like four years or something has gotten an average of 4,000 feature film submissions every single year. Think about that. 4,000 feature film submissions to the Sundance film festival. Now everyone sends their script into the Sundance, right? Um, so a lot of those are probably not gonna be very good, but that's a lot of submit. That's a lot of people making a lot of movies. And, and while very few of them are going to see the light of day, all of them need a screenwriter, right? All of them start somewhere with maybe a, an amazing story on the page. And so my, my, my hope for you guys, my, my encouragement to you guys is that if you write that story that really does stand out, um, it's, it's then just a matter of connecting. It's just, then just a matter of connecting with the, appropriate producer, somebody who's suitable for it. And there's a whole, there's a whole thing about that, but uh, we can get into that another day. So hopefully this makes sense. Didn't mean to go off on uh, my little spiel about me at the end, but there are a couple of you guys who are, who don't know me um, yet. Fernando asks, what would be some difference between a Hollywood film and for example, an Australian film? My first thought is budget. Okay. So uh, without going too far into it, yeah, the budget is a big thing. Consider this. Um, Australia has around about 30 million people. Uh, the U S has around about 330 million people. Um, so there's a bigger potential audience in the U S plus U S films have a big market all around the world. Uh, Australian films are kind of a niche product usually, so they can appeal to local Aussies. Um, they don't always carry internationally. Mm, international audiences, for whatever reason, struggle with the accent or uh, or just feels like a it's not a mainstream Hollywood film. So a lot of Australian films get made with American accents, ironically. Um, <laughs> to try to appeal to that more, that international market. So the, the, the challenge is if there's a, if there's a smaller market for your film, then the budget's going to have to come down, right? The budget's going to have to be smaller it, correspondingly, because if you, you can't make a hundred million dollar film, 
when there's only an upside possible of, you know, $5 million gross, right? So, but you could make a $1 million film or a $500,000 film with a $5 million potential gross. So what happens often is the Aussie films tend to be um, smaller budget, which, which tends to limit a lot of what you can do uh, in the visual effects, which means that you tend to tell smaller stories or not necessarily smaller, but more personal stories, more intimate stories, more uh, real world stories, um, you know, all that kind of thing. So, um, so you don't usually have these big epic extravaganzas that you're going to see out of Hollywood because Hollywood is uniquely positioned to do that because they make they have huge budgets for that. Now that said, I think Luc, Luc Besson did a like the most expensive sci-fi film Europe ever made independently last year, or the year before, whatever it was. Um, it didn't do very well, unfortunately, which is now bad for the rest of the indie film world. Uh, but it's possible like we, the money can be pooled in other regions to make those bigger films. So, you know, it really depends on, uh, it, it, it's, it, those are, those are the sort of budgetary issues, but then culturally as well, Australia is not America. I, I lived in Australia for, uh, well, Australia, New Zealand for almost 20 years. And the, they, Australia is very different to New Zealand. Uh, they're both very different to the U S so just because you can't just take an, an American film and, and make it in Australia because there's a different sensibility. There's different cultural um, cues. There's different um, sense of humor. There's uh, different ways the character probably go about solving their problems, just all sorts of things, right? If you think of, because uh, Fernando, I think you're in, um, you're in Mexico. Is that right? Uh, so if you think about a Mexican film, is that right? Yeah. Uh, if you think about a Mexican film, or the, the way sort of, you know, the, the cultural heritage of Mexico, how, what that brings to the characters in the story, what that brings to the situation, it's obviously going to, it, it's going to make characters do things differently. There's a great example. Uh, I literally the other day just watched Coco, which if you haven't watched Coco, this this animated uh, Pixar film, just one best animated feature, uh, rightly so, absolutely fantastic and, and and a lesson in storytelling so you could study that film and see just it's so beautiful from a storytelling standpoint dialogue uh, the characters the situations the twists the reveals all that stuff is just it's fantastic you really should watch it um but what I liked most about it, or what, what I found really interesting, was we're seeing sort of the Hollywood type of storytelling, but with the Mexican cultural s storytelling, um, cultural sensitivities, and and you're seeing you're seeing the Mexican version of the Hollywood story, right? Which was if if you can look at a story like that and watch some other sort of American story that might help you sort of see what, how those stories are, are, are somewhat different. So uh, it's not just budget, but that is a very large thing to do with probably the defining difference in feature uh, between the two, two uh, countries. But it's also the, um, but it's also sort of the way things happen and how stories are told. If you, if you were to write a Russian film, Russians, the Russians don't like happy endings in general. <laughs> the movies that do better in Russia, historically anyway, um, have always had tragic or downbeat endings. There's something about the culture. They, 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 they don't believe the happy ending or, they're, or they just don't respond to it. It doesn't feel authentic or real. So they tend to prefer the more ironic or tragic or twisty sort of endings. Um, uh, so you know, you obviously you can sell a great film anywhere. <laughs> a great story is a great story, but as far as the kinds of movies that get made, these are things to, to factor in as well. So hopefully that wasn't too long <laughs> an answer, but Fernando asks, uh, does it make a difference to producers to send the script plus the art of the movie? For example, drawings plus a five to six minute teaser of the movie does it have more of a chance to get made? And if, if it does, why? I might save this question for uh, the next session because I feel like we're going a little bit long now today. And that's a sort of, there's a big question you've just asked. Um, the short answer, like too long, didn't read, TL, colon, semicolon, DR, <laughs> is um, uh, don't do it. <laughs> we don't, generally speaking, you want to send just the script. 
if uh, if you've if if it's an animation, uh, you can often t send some animation styles with it to give a sense of what it's supposed to look like, or or at least what you have in mind for it. But always understand that the other, that the rest of the team is going to be making the movie, right? So the writer's job. Now you may become the writer slash some other job on the movie, but the writer's job is to write the movie. So uh, we want to make sure that the script itself is. Um, says all it needs to say. So we don't want to have fancy fonts on the front page. We don't want to have uh, drawings in there. We don't want to have um, notes in the sidebars. We want the, we want the cinema experience on the page. So when we read that script, we see the movie in our, in our imagination. Make sense? So uh, that's the short answer. Uh, remind me again next week. And we'll, uh, maybe I'll go in a little bit more detail about that. If that's cool. Sound good? <laughs> okay. Hopefully that sounds good. Uh, all right. Good stuff. So uh, we'll leave it at that. And I want to say thank you so much, guys, for joining me. Um, be sure to take action every day. Screenwriting is a, a craft. And as a craft, it takes time and it takes energy. And you just have to keep plugging away at it. So don't just think about it one day a week. Take action every day. Keep practicing. Keep experiencing. Keep moving forward and have fun with it. There's no right or wrong. This is a creative exercise. Even if your script doesn't go anywhere, this is creative expression and creative outlet. If you have fun with it, that magic is gonna come through onto the pages and, uh, and you'll probably get a little more traction than if you try to figure out the best way to make and sell something, right? So have fun, take action. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks again to Eddie for being brave and sharing your work.